But how many of you owned a box of crayons when you were a kid? There was a crayon in there marked flesh. Did it match you? Didn't match me either, right? I mean, it's just some pinkish, beigeish, looks half dead looking thing like that. I mean, it's like a larva crawled out from underneath something, right? What the fuck? Right? Didn't I say blonde hair, blue eyes was as far the north? Yeah. We all have, our genetic makeup is, is such that we're a big hodgepodge. There are, gen, they, we have genetic markers in our systems uh, for things we don't do anymore. We still have the hibernation gene. Humans could literally, if we could figure out how to turn a gene on and off, we could literally hibernate. In fact, NASA is spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on that because that's how you're going to do your stasis tube to get to Jupiter. Just to hibernate. Humans have the capacity. We have the genetic ability. We just don't know how to do it. Right? How do we suddenly, you know, how does a bear suddenly plug up his butt so he doesn't poop and curl up in a ball and go to sleep and gives birth while sleeping and the cub just kind of crawls up, attaches, and they wake up in the spring and go, hey, where'd you come from? I mean, all of these things that you go, oh, that can't be, right? It's just normal. So let's talk about, here's our good friend Bill Nye, the science guy. Researchers have proven scientifically that humans are all one people. The color of our ancestors' skin and ultimately my eye skin and your skin is a consequence of the ultraviolet light of latitude and climate. Despite our recent sad conflicts here in the United States, there really is no such thing scientifically as race. We are one species. Each of us is much more alike than we are different. We all come from Africa. We are all made of the same stardust. We are all going to live and die on the same planet, a pale blue dot in the vastness of space. We have to work together. So, in this country, and in most of, the, of Western Europe, when it comes to race, because we wish to enforce it, we rely on a, on a practice that is referred to as hypodescent. And that means that if you have one drop, or one percent, it used to be called one drop of, of, of blood, but let's say that you have, if you have any genetic makeup of a race other than the one that, you, that, you, you, that, that is in power, uh, you identify with the lower race. So, for example, Barack Obama was our first black president, right? But he was actually our first half-black president. Because his mom was white. He was raised by his grandparents. He was raised in a white world. It wasn't until he got to college that he actually was able to seek out other African Americans and adopt black culture. Because he had been raised in white culture. He had to appropriate, essentially, right? But Dwight Eisenhower's grandmother was black. So... He was a quarter black. Why don't we call Barack Obama our first half-white president? That's just as accurate, right? And he, unlike, because his father was a true African instead of an African-American, because he would be less than 50% black if it was an African-American. So in places like the United States, the offspring of a mixed union is always labeled the lower one. What race are these two young ladies? They look a lot different, don't they? One's got freckles and red hair. Are those, are twins? those are twins. This is the family. Every single one of them is a different fucking color. What race are they? I mean, this guy's about as white as you can get. I mean, he's bright red, right? He's a redneck almost, right? Mom's pretty dark. She looks a little mixed. But these are the two I've just been, no. Yeah, these are the two I've been just showing you, right? And there's the brother. He's a little darker than that one, but lighter than this one. And this one's a little, and there's the other boy. He's about the same shade. What the fuck, right? These are genetic twins. They share 100% of the same DNA. There is no genetic difference between this girl and this girl. You run their DNA because twins have 100% of the same DNA. They are exactly the same. But they look different. But their DNA is identical. What race are they? 
human. Things are good. You know, I said, I'm the Olympic gold medal. And three days ago, I fought for this country in Rome. I won the gold medal, and I'm going to eat. The manager, I heard him tell the manager, and she says, he said, well, I'm not the, I'm not the man that he's got to go out. Anyway, I didn't raise no money. They put me out. And I had to leave that restaurant in my hometown where I went to church and served in their Christianity and fought and daddy fought in all the wars. Just wanted to go mentally and couldn't eat downtown. I said, something's wrong. And from then on, I've been a Muslim. So, Jesus. Remember he mentions, what about black Jesus? Right? Why, is all, why is Jesus always white? Where did Jesus come from? From where? From, well, she said Europe. Anybody got another place? It would have been Palestine, yeah. He's from the Middle East. You know anybody in the Middle East that looks like this? Right? Anybody here with Middle Eastern ancestry? You want to come up and we'll compare? Right? Take a good look. I, I mean, I, do you see the resemblance? Do you know who this is actually a picture of? It's not actually this one. The one where you always see him praying, you know, the blonde, blue-eyed, not the green-eyed one, but the blue-eyed one. That's Cesare Borgia. You know who the Borgias are? They're one of the most deadly families in European history. The reason that Cesare was chosen was because his father was Pope. Think about that. And he commissioned that blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. As far as what we know that Jesus looked like, we have these images. This is from the first century in Rome. Kind of hard to tell. Right? Here we are at the Madonna. And the baby, here's Joseph. Uh, this is uh, uh, supposed to be Jesus. Can't really tell, right? But I don't see the blue eyes. This is the Cesare Borgia. You'll find this one in a lot of churches. Might even find, you know, the buff Jesus, right? The I'm going to kick your ass and look romantic Jesus. Right? Anybody ever been to St. Teresa, not St. Teresa, St. Genevieve's Catholic Church here in town. It's down in Chinatown. It was built for a Chinese congregation. The Stations of the Cross, the 12 pieces of art that go around the church, are Italian ceramics. They're absolutely beautiful. They're some of the prettiest things I've ever seen. And according to those Stations of the Cross, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, all of the apostles, John the Baptist, are all Chinese. Why would that be any more shocking than having him look like this? Right? None of them look like him. We don't know what he looked like. This is what we've got. Right? So, he can be the black Jesus. He can be the black buff Jesus. He can be the Chinese Jesus. There's John the Baptist baptizing Christ. Here you see the birth of Christ. Is that any more wrong than having blue-eyed, green-eyed, blonde-haired people? I mean, you're looking at that going, uh, even some of you that are Asian are looking at it going, uh, right? Why not? Right? This is probably closer to what he looked like. I don't know, it just doesn't have the same ring as that Cesare Borgia one, does it? We do this a lot. What's the difference? Honestly, what is the difference between those two pictures? One's got a Bible, one's got a Quran. I'm sorry, what? Not even the color of the skin. They're pretty damn close, right? But one elicits pride and patriotism and Americanism, and the other one is, oh my God, she's scary. If you were on the other side looking at her, wouldn't she be just as scary as that one is to you? Open your eyes. Look at the world. When I'm talking about cultural relativity, I really mean you've got to judge other societies or other groups, or in your case, other whatever it is you're going to be observing, on their own terms, not yours. So a Chinese Jesus is fine. It's no more weird than a blue-eyed Jesus, which is just fucking wrong. It's my sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white. Blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins. And we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. 
And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law, is in front of me. And she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me, and I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up, and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up. And she says, yes. Yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check, and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up. No conversation. She looks up at me. Absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check, and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point, my daughter looks at me, and she gets very, very embarrassed, and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye, like, Mommy, you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do, because behind me are two elderly white women, right? And I'm thinking, OK, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're going to be. And I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I say, you know, some things you got to choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, right? So the, the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating, now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10, my sister-in-law walks back over. And she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you. You've been. She goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh. I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. Nearly half of Americans believe discrimination against white people is as big a problem as discrimination against people of color. Some people call this reverse racism. But here's the thing. If racism were reversed, that would mean racism wouldn't exist in the first place. And by calling discrimination against white people reverse racism, you're also acknowledging the power dynamic and saying that white people are the primary upholders of racism, which actually is true. That can't be reversed unless hundreds of years of systemic oppression are erased. White people can experience prejudice and discrimination from people of color, but they do not experience racism. Let's break that down. Racial prejudice typically starts with the belief in stereotypes about groups of people. Racial discrimination is all about actions and unfair treatment based on prejudice. And racism is a form of discrimination based on skin color and ethnic origin. It's kept alive through power and institutional reinforcement. In the United States, prejudice towards people of color is still supported by our most powerful institutions, which means racism is still very much alive. And it didn't magically disappear because we have a black president. Black people, for example, experienced 250 years of slavery in the United States and 100 years of legalized discrimination with black codes and Jim Crow. In the years to follow, 
legal discrimination still continued in the form of housing discrimination, job discrimination, no positive representation on television, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, stop and frisk, and so much more. So when things like affirmative action, BET, and Black Lives Matter pop up, these things are there in an effort to level the playing field, not to tip the scale the other way. If white people experienced racism, they would have to undergo hundreds of years of legal oppression just like people of color still do. White people can experience discrimination in many ways, and it's not okay. But racism just isn't one of them. Well, how, how, how are your children doing? Are they all right? <laughs> How are they? My kids are good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they can't, on paper, they're great. They're two little white girls in America. Right, right. I mean, what? Yeah. Sometimes I look at it that way. I look yeah. at them, I'm like, you can't say anything. Yeah. You're, you're doing awesome. Right. Just boilerplate, great lives. I gave my daughter medicine the other day, and it was bubblegum flavored, so that she'll take it. Bubblegum flavored medicine? Yeah, you get me like Tylenol, it's bubblegum flavored. Oh, it's not she, methadone or anything. It's no, 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 it's bubblegum oh. flavored. <laughs> I give her, she's got a fever, Tylenol, bubblegum flavor. And she goes, ew. I'm like, F you, ew. <laughs> you can't say ew. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess it's, it's medicine. It's medicine, right, exactly. It's medicine. Most children don't have medicine. Right. Most children in the world, they yeah. get sick, they die on a rock with a bear eating them. <laughs> that's, that's how they handle it. Right, right, right. And, oh, he's got a sniffle, ring the bear bell and put him outside, whatever they do. <laughs> You're a little white girl in America. You wear clothes made by children your age professionally. <laughs> you don't get to say ew <laughs> about your bubblegum medicine. <laughs> I never heard of bubblegum medicine. Well. Oh, all right. I mean, you got the holidays coming up. Are you doing any, any plans? Any no. You seem I, like a very I, holiday guy. I, look, and I just, yeah. I just want to say I'm not trying to say that if you're white, you can't complain. Right. I'm just saying that if you're black, you get to complain more. Right, right. Because <laughs> you can't. There you go. No, don't, don't tell the band that. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you can't. You get this right. You can't take people's like historical context away from them. And right. everybody wants this to. Like white people are always like, come on, it wasn't us. Like they want black people to forget everything. Like every year, white people add a hundred years to how long ago slavery was. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard educated white people say slavery was four hundred years ago. <laughs> no, it very wasn't. <laughs> It was 140 years ago. That's two 70-year-old ladies living and dying back to back. <laughs> That's how recently <laughs> you could buy a guy. That's it. And it's not like slavery ended and then everything has been amazing. <laughs> like it just... Oh, I'm glad that's over. Oh, yeah, it just ended like a clean <laughs> where you don't have to wipe. Just boom. And then it's just been parades and presents yeah, ever yeah, since. Exactly. You got to... You gotta remember that if you meet a black person, they have gray hair, they remember a time they weren't allowed to use a certain toilet. So give them a little, you know, time to be cranky. And by the way, white people have our own thing that we, yeah. stuff that we went sure, through. Sure, sure. That, that hurt us that we have to cope with. Like when they took our slaves away. That was really <laughs> hard for us. And we're still, so it's pretty even. <laughs> so, it's, so it's even. Yeah. It's even. All right, be right back with Aaron Ralston. <laughs>